Okay, so why don't we get started again? I'm Mike Cahill, I'm your mayor. And as people were just logging in, I'll, I'll repeat, we have a, several of our elected officials joining us, City Councilor at Large, Julie Flowers, uh, Ward 1 City Councilor Todd Rotundo, Ward 3 City Councilor Stacey Ames, Ward 1 School Committee, Woman and School Committee President Rachel A. Bell, and Ward 4 City Councilor Scott Hausman. That's who I see thus far. I see any other of our fellow elected officials join us, I'll try to let you know. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna briefly frame it, frame the, the conversation, and then Darlene Wynn, the city's planning director, will uh, present. Once we've done that, we're just gonna throw it open to a conversation. Um, so first, uh, let, me, let me lead by saying um, there's been a, a long, conversation in Beverly around, obviously that, hang on one sec. The, uh, a long conversation over decades and, and spanning a couple of master plans. Um, and, and so we all understand master plans are documents that guide a community uh, as it plans out its, its coming 10 to 15 years. They have a, a number of categories. Um, that are required, um, such as uh, arts and culture, housing, transportation, um, uh, open space and recreation. There are actually seven of them, and maybe Darlene, who knows them all by heart, can touch on that, and maybe she can double check us on the face. So, so at any rate, we, we know that, that all master plans, and ours included, touch on the, this range of, of issues and priorities and concerns. And a master plan is meant to express a community's values and be utilized as a roadmap from that point forward. So in, in the 2003 master plan, um, among other things, uh, there, there was a real um, priority put on addressing the community's really kind of significant and unmet housing needs through a transit-oriented development strategy model. The idea that it makes sense to, to put more housing in, in basically denser development where you can walk to public transportation, where you know it doesn't suggest that everybody who lives in a neighborhood that, that is near public transit is only ever going to use that and won't ever use an automobile. No, you know, nobody would suggest that. But what it does, what um, what is found, you know, place place by place, anywhere that there's um, quality development around public transit is there are fewer vehicles and there are fewer vehicle trips per person, per housing unit. And that's, that's seen as a more sustainable way of, of, of um, continuing to develop uh, both for economic development needs and for housing, meeting housing needs. Um, so that's something that was prioritized in the 2003 master plan. And the idea of a rezoning or an overlay zoning uh, amendment for the Bass River waterfront was expressed as a recommendation in that master plan. The uh, tall building overlay along Green Tool Street was prioritized to be done first. We all know that that you started to see some development along Green Tool Street as a result of that. And then the Great Recession hit and everything kind of sat on the shelf for several years. And what we've seen since coming out of that is, is a, a good amount of redevelopment of properties along the Rantoul Street corridor. We recognize that it was time for a new master planning process a few years ago. And I think, we, I think the process we undertook collectively with a lot of community involvement really led to the community shaping the plan. Um, and we learned a lot of things as a, as a city leadership and administration in that process, um, such that some of the recommendations of the new master plan include, you know, there, there's clearly, you know this because you, you, you're in the meeting tonight and you saw in the notice that there's a reaffirmation of the, um, the opportunity and, and the need to meet the city's housing, remaining housing needs. There's a, and Darlene can explain that more specifically. Um, through some potential redevelopment along the Bass River waterfront for more residential and accommodation of residential and commercial. Um, in, in addition, we learned both through the master planning process and I think also the, the Depot Square 2 process was really, I think, instructive and enlightening for all of us 
Um, and so one thing that the recommendations include coming with the new master plan are to um, take the scale down some. So looking at the remaining, um, remaining potential development in the tall building overlay, we have intentions to reverse that. And you know, the, essentially what we've collectively learned is that there's only so much height that we all want to see moving forward. Um, and so when you look at the Mantoul Street corridor, we're talking about coming down from that potential to go above a four stories over one or a five story. Um, so that's one zoning change that we're looking at. Uh, another is when we've, when we've looked at the Bass River overlay, potential overlay district, we're looking at a smaller scale as well. And Darlene, again, can go into some of the details, but I, I'll, I'll tell you that there's been a lot of thought around uh, when, you, when you're on River Street, looking at a potential four story over one, and then as you get closer to the riverfront, a two or a two and a half story over one for any buildings that are closer to the river. Um, by two and a half, I think what's meant there is two stories and then with step backs where it's not so noticeable away from the river, you might have part of a building back of it being three over one. So those are just some thoughts about how you, uh, how you might see density there. Um, part of the reason, well, Darlene's gonna go into all the details. So let me leave it there except to say, when the master plan reaffirmed this as a strong recommendation, it seemed to be, I shouldn't say it seemed, it, it, it's natural that it would be the first of the uh, proposed zoning changes or amendments that, would, that we would address coming out of the gates with this new master plan. We had intention of trying to accomplish that this calendar year with the existing city council in place and, and me recommending. It's become clear from a lot of the work we've done and are continuing to do to prepare that it's much more likely that what we're talking about is a process that we're really kicking off tonight publicly that is gonna be a conversation over the next few months with hopes that we'll be ready to present a proposal to the city council early in the next session. So that, that's the thinking right now. Um, just to give you a sense of timeline, um, now through the end of the calendar year, which is really, let's, let's all be fair to ourselves and each other. There's a point where the holidays kind of pause the public meetings that can be productive. So we've, you know, we've got the next couple months that we'll be working on this, working on this together, certainly public conversations and input, and then looking ahead past the new year uh, for potential uh, consideration by the planning board and city council of an overlay. So I'll stop there and turn to Darlene, who, as I said, has a presentation following on which, as I said, we'll just throw it open to discussion. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you. Um, I just want to note that we have 95 people on the call, 97. Um, and I believe we have a limit of 100. Um, so if you hear from anybody that they are having a hard time getting in, um, we may have misjudged um, <laughs> on how this is happening, but this is being recorded. And so we are happy to share um, you know, the recording will be shared with YouTube, oh, sorry, the recording will be shared with BevCam and who posted on their YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, and this is, as the mayor said, it's not the last opportunity to give feedback or get feedback. Um, I'm not sure if we have another option to switch to more, um, at this point. Um, but, uh, if maybe either Chelsea or Jocelyn can check in with Garrett, but, um, with that, Chelsea, if you could start the presentation. So you can go to the next slide. So I think, you know, Mayor gave a great introduction. Um, and I guess I should start again. I'm Darlene when I'm the planning director, if I haven't met you. I've been with the city for six years, um, also a Beverly resident. Um, became the planning director in April of 2020, um, just after we finished, you know, the bulk of the master plan. So. Um, I was here last time when we were working on this in 2017 and trying to take a stab at it, and I've been with the city throughout the master plan process. Um, so we're here, as the mayor said, taking a look at this again and bringing it back because we heard 
that it was still a priority um, and it's a great opportunity for the city in terms of redevelopment and economic development and housing creation. So this is the this is our idea of a zoning process. This is kind of what typically happens, especially with something that um, is more large, larger change like this, rather than just kind of a, a language change that doesn't have as significant of an impact on people. Um, so today is the first of, of more public meetings. We'll have stakeholder meetings. Um, and then at the time when we feel ready, we'll submit an ordinance to city council. And they typically have a joint public hearing with the planning board and city council. Um, they could each have their own public hearings. Um, and then the planning board would take a vote to recommend or would vote on the recommendation to city council and then the city council would then vote on it. Um, and during that time and during these next few months, we've also realized as we've been exploring this that we need some additional technical assistance. So we've brought on uh, UTL who helped us with our master plan. We've contracted with them to help us craft design standards and guidelines. And we're starting with the Bass River Overlay District. Um, this is something else that we heard loud and clear from the master planning process and from the review of the, the latest development project downtown that the, we wanted to take another look at our design standards. And so we're gonna start with the Bass River, but then extend that project onto downtown and other neighborhoods. Um, and at the same time, for reasons that I will get to kind of towards the end of the presentation, um, you know, we also are planning on bringing somebody on, an engineering firm on to help us kind of get our hands around, our, our head around climate resiliency measures that um, are important for this area of the city. Next slide. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think the mayor did a great job and I won't, I won't dwell on this too much, but just to point out that between 2002 and 2020, uh, there are seven plans um, that the city has, has done, or um, I think one was Main Streets in part, um, who have recommendations that relate to the master plan, or that relate to the, to the Bass River, um, whether it's uh, redevelopment and increasing housing opportunities at the river, but also providing greater access to uh, open space and to the waterfront at the river. Um, and then the last, the, the one on the bottom, the Beverly Bass River District Action Plan. Chelsea, if you can go to the, well, I'll talk about that one in a second. If you can go to the next slide. So just to note back in 2002, as the mayor said, this master plan even talked about this area as an opportunity for redevelopment before the term transit oriented development really even existed. Um, and it, the guiding principles were to capitalize on the area's proximity to the train station, rezone to permit mixed uses. Um, and it also mentioned dredging the Bass River, which is something else that we're working on, but would also support maritime uses or, or waterfront uses in the Bass River area. Um, next slide. So then this is the 2014 Bass River District Vision and Action Plan that the Metrop Metropolitan Area Planning Council uh, prepared with the city. Um, I believe this was started under the prior administration, but finished after this mayor came into office. Um, and again, it reiterates and, and kind of honed in and, and provided some more clear zoning recommendations on what a Bass River district um, would look like. But again, active mix of uses, creating physical and visual access to the waterfront, as well as a shoreline trail, um, and connecting downtown across the tracks as well, visually um, and in, in character, um, and balancing the mixes of use, mix of uses with the industrial uses that are also surrounding that area. Um, so not completely eliminating some of the important industrial uh, uses that we have in the downtown. Chelsea, if you could go to the next slide. And then finally, just to you know, summarize the Plan Beverly process, which is our latest master plan that we uh, officially, uh, the planning board adopted December of last year. So again, uh, we heard a lot of the same things allowing mixed use commercial and residential near the train station and multifamily and mixed use by right, um, taking a look at the zoning requirements that would allow for a feasible and functional development that creates a neighborhood in that area or a, a place to be, but also leveraging that new development to create public open space along the Bass River. Um, and as part of that, because of the size of we may, the size of the blocks, we may need new streets. So there's other infrastructure pieces that 
uh, are going to come into play and new development is the way that that would uh, enable us to get access that is meaningful and useful at the waterfront. Uh, next slide, Chelsea. So we, we've all, we both hit on these a lot, but you know, why are we rezoning the Bass River? Why are we suggesting, why are we talking about it? Um, and, and so just to ground you, the area in question that we have long talked about for the rezoning is proposed district that is highlighted. Um, it's approximately 14 acres, uh, includes some land on the other side of River Street, although I, I will note that you know, one of the things we've long heard and we don't really want to touch the depot, but there might be other opportunities. Um, and so proximity to the train station is, you know, this has been seen as, you know, regionally and from, from other uh, experienced planners and consultants that have come in as well as affirmed in the master planning process, this is a prime opportunity for transit oriented development and creating new housing opportunities um, and generating new investment in the city, all of which help the city provide public services. But also the opportunity to redevelop um, is the opportunity for us to, to create public access to the river. So um, without that, um, none of the current owners of these properties, which are all privately owned, have any reason or impetus or requirement to create access um, to the riverfront in any more meaningful way than is provided today. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So to focus specifically on the housing and economic piece of it, um, you know, we did a housing, a community housing plan that was shown on the slide a couple a couple slides ago in 2016. Um, and it highlighted that for our local housing need, we have housing need across the board, um, regardless of income or age or household status, there is housing need. And that has you know, really continued to grow since 2016. But in that plan, it showed that 23% of renters and 12.5% of homeowners are severely cost burdened. Um, that means they're paying more than 50% of their income towards housing costs. Um, and, and supply, a limited supply, is a primary factor in those rising prices that we've seen. So we know that um, prices have, housing prices have continued to go up. And I think everybody's aware that I mean, there's been uh, a movement of people moving, you know, seeming to move out to Beverly. And people are saying, we built all these units, but housing prices haven't gone down. Well, because our supply currently is uh, the new units that we're creating is much lower than historically what we've created. And there was a, a large lull in early 2000s and 2000, 2014, where the city wasn't really creating many new units at all. Um, and so comparatively, there is still really a significant supply crunch, um, which is contributing to rising prices and the, the, um, the cost burden that people are feeling. Uh, it's one of the reasons, I should say. And then, you know, the state has projected that um, overall, you know, 500,000 new housing units are required in order to keep up with economic growth um, and have employees for the job creation and, and keep companies in Massachusetts. Um, of course, we are not absorbing all of that, but a lot of it is, you know, expected to be felt here on the Northeast because we're where the job centers are as well. Um, Chelsea, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and, and just another uh, another tidbit. So I think with with growth, one of the other things to keep in mind is that over time the household size has gone down. So while it feels like there are a significant number of new units being created, and there there are new units, the num the population does not rise at the same percentage of the housing units created because um, over time, households are getting smaller, approximately 30% of um, uh, households in Beverly are single households. Um, and so while we are building and proposing to build additional units, they're at, uh, you know, the population is not rising as quickly and many of those units are having one or two people in them. Next slide. 
so then one of the other critical reasons uh, for proposing this rezoning on the Bass River area is for the public access component, which I mentioned before that there's, there's currently no reason um, the city doesn't own any of these parcels and there's no way for, there's no reason for any of these private property owners to create a meaningful path or meaning, meaningful access to the riverfront. Um, there is a path currently, um, a very small walkway to the waterfront next to the national grid site. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a particularly enjoyable place to be. Um, but any, any um, property owner who seeks to redevelop one of these properties will have to go through the state, uh, state waterways licensing process, which is referred to as chapter 91. Um, and I can, I'll get into that a little bit later, but it, it requires um, that certain portions of the riverfront area will be uh, public access and have public amenities and not be able to be de developed. So it would both help us facilitate a path along the Bass River and around the Bass River is, has been one of the goals in, in the latest master plan as well as prior plans, but also to connect River Street to the river um, and then beyond you know, connecting to the remaining part of downtown uh, across and around the depot. Um, and this is just a, a, a conceptual sketch. It doesn't really mean anything, but just generally showing, you know, where the open space could be and how the lots could be, how the parcels could be laid out. Next slide. And then finally, um, you know, what we've come to learn more recently as we just wrapped up our climate action plan um, is that another opportunity for redevelopment on the Bass River is being able to increase the resilience of this area of the city, um, which is one of our more susceptible areas to flooding, coastal flooding and storm, uh, can't think of the word anymore, but, but flooding, <laughs> uh, storm surge. Um, and, and so this also gives us another opportunity, as I mentioned, we're looking, we're, we're looking to engage with an engineering team to kind of help us think about what, uh, whether it be a soft landscape edge or a hard edge or, um, what other type of infrastructure could help address that and um, mitigate the impacts of flooding, both for the use of the river um, and future development and other areas. So let's see, we can go to the next slide. And apologies, this one did not come out great, but this is um, the coastal flood, a coastal flood risk map that was prepared um, originally as part of our climate action plan and updated. And it just shows, so these, Chelsea, you could maybe hover around. The, the outline is of the proposed zoning area is in red, but these blue areas are, this is the most extreme situation of flooding, the 2071% flood zone depth. Um, and those represent, let's see, you know, um, 10 feet of flooding or at times greater than 10 feet of flooding um, in some of those areas. And so we have to plan to both protect that land um, and also think about how we design and how we require buildings to be designed in order to think about what the potential risks for future flooding are. And Chelsea, you can go to the next slide. Oh, so move that around. So, um, and again, I mentioned the chapter 91 jurisdiction. This is the state wetlands waterways regulation. So the chapter 91 line is there. So Chelsea's then awaiting it for me. Um, thank you. <laughs> so anything, um, you know, any project um, within that line is subject to state waterways regulations. And this map particularly shows, so the shoreline is the green line, but it shows the um, water dependent use zone, which the blue to the left of the bridge is 100 feet. Uh, to the right of the bridge, it's smaller, both 33 and 35 feet because the lots themselves are smaller there. The water dependent use zone is based on the lot size. And in that area, it's important to just point out that um, there can only be water dependent uses there as, as the line, the, the jurisdiction is noted. And so, um, we, you know, buildings that contain residential uses uh, would not be allowed there. Um, 
even restaurants that do not serve a marine or marina type population would not be allowed there. Um, so that in itself is, is limiting and a constraint to these properties, um, but enables us to provide some room for public access. It's the primary goal of that area is both water dependent uses, which could be smaller scale, you know, there, there could be marina there, there could be, um, you know, an industrial boatyard, uh, you know, other things that depend on being near the water, other industrial types of uses, types of uses. Um, but there could not be uh, residential uses on in that area. Uh, and Chelsea, you can go to the next slide. And then this is, it's, it's also a similar zone, but it's called the facilities of public accommodation. So if you'll note on the, on the right side of, um, or the north side of the bridge, it's a larger area. Um, so in facilities of public accommodation, it does overlap with the water dependent use zone, but um, you know, they can only, you have to have, as it says, public accommodation or public, publicly accessible uses in that zone. So these are other variances and factors to think about. Um, Chelsea, go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, there's a number of constraints to these properties, both with vulnerability and resilience, uh, future resilience, the chapter 91 waterways boundaries. Some of these properties are contaminated soils. There are underground utilities existing that have easements. Um, you know, challenging for us is that they're all large parcels and they're owned by separate people. Um, so we couldn't undertake a, an overall master plan for this area. Um, there's currently a disconnect from Rantoul Street, uh, which means, you know, challenges what we want to require there in terms of retail and commercial use. And uh, and then obviously, I, I just wanted to bring up everybody knows the future bridge sheet work, which is coming down the line in a couple of years. So that will need to come into play too. Next slide. So we, we've also heard, heard your concerns and, um, and I think we'll hear more of them tonight and we look forward to helping, uh, helping you understand where we're coming from and understand your thoughts and questions as well. Building height and scale, we've heard that before and we mentioned that already as well as design and character, um, parking for recreation and additional development as well as uh, traffic generation and primarily ensuring public access and enjoyment of the riverfront. Uh, next slide. So, and just to touch on, this is the current, currently this land, which I probably should have mentioned this before, is zone general industrial. Um, flexible set of uses with limited dimensional requirements allowed. So um, there's not a lot of setbacks required here. There's often, you could have office retail manufacturing, um, and the allowable heights are 35 to 70 feet, uh, which is allowed under certain conditions, um, but most of the buildings here are, are not that tall, about 35 feet probably, maybe a couple that are taller. Um, and it's important to note too that we are proposing to do an overlay district, which means this zoning stays in place. And the overlay district only comes into play um, if somebody is looking to take advantage of one of the uses or you, to play one of the uses that's allowed under the overlay district that's not allowed under the um, industrial district. That's important for some of the users that are there who, want, who may want to continue um, operations. So um, we didn't want to limit them in their ability to expand. Um, next slide. So we've shared zoning back in 2017 and we heard some comments and we've made um, we're continuing to make tweaks, and this this is really just a highlight of the I think what are the key elements that people generally are concerned about. What types of uses would be allowed in the overlay district? Multifamily housing, mixed use housing that has some commercial use in it, water dependent, um, retail, restaurant, and office services, um, perhaps in a mixed use building, and then of course public access and recreation. We are talking about a four over one height, understanding that the one might need to be floodable space. Um, and that might need to be at a flood zone that's a little bit higher than normal as well. So, you know, 12 feet, if we're trying to get over the 10 foot flood zone. Um, and as the mayor discussed, um, we're looking, we think it's important that the 
the five stories is on the River Street side and the shorter buildings might be located closer to the water. Um, the setbacks are comparable to what you'd see in an urban or kind of neighborhood, downtown neighborhood setting. Um, and then we're looking to further refine, but to set a larger setback from the river that would be consistent with what chapter, 90 regula chapter 91 regulations require and allow for an area that can serve as both publicly accessible open space and usable open space, uh, as well as address their resiliency concerns. Um, in addition to that, we are looking for, you know, that the sites would have 10% uh, open space within the, the building footprints as well. Um, and maintaining the same parking ratio that is on the other side of the depot for residential, um, primarily because of the location next to the train station and knowing that, um, Based on our research, the multifamily projects that have been built in recent years uh, have less than one parking space per unit as is. Um, and then let's see, next slide. So that's really the end of my presentation. Um, I said that's the last slide is really just kind of an outline of what the major factors we're thinking about for a future overlay district. Um, and we're here now to kind of hear your concerns and your questions and understand um, that this is the remaining process. And I think there's one more slide, it's just a picture. That's it. And I think, Mayor, do you wanna mm -hmm. navigate questions? Do you want me to? Um. Let's do this. Um, just so everybody knows how to operate the, the meeting features, if you click on reactions at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the raise hand function. That's probably how we want to have people uh, you know, share thoughts or questions. Um, so if you want to speak, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand either now or as, as we get further in. Um, we can, in the meantime, as a few people, you know, queue up to speak, um, there are a couple of questions that we can lead with that are typed into the chat. Um, so Sean O'Neill asked a couple of questions. Where's, what's the empirical, empirical data on a few things? The ties economic development to the specific need of a tall building overlay. Um, at, at the outset of the meeting, I, I talked about how the tall building overlay on Main Tool Street that's been utilized there have been a number of the projects in that area that have not sought a special permit for the, for the additional height. And then the last few have. Um, even though special permit is a part of zoning, it, I think uh, it gets confused in the public process often, and it's seen as some kind of special favor. It's a special permit process because it requires a number of criteria be met, and, and, and then the the planning board can approve or not approve based on those criteria. But nonetheless, we're looking to move away from special permits, both in by potentially uh, reversing that tall building overlay along Rantoul, and also as we look at the proposal that eventually we hope will come on the Bass River overlay, we're looking to try to uh, eliminate special permit um, components to that. So in terms of what's the need for density, as, as Darlene said, we all want more access to the waterfront. And in Massachusetts, where most of the waterfront was sold off in the 1600s, and it's, most of it's been privately owned for hundreds of years, the one way that the state has a hook to gain public access at, at our waterfronts is when a public, pro I'm sorry, a private property owner on the waterfront tries to develop or redevelop. In other words, make significant investments in their property. And that's the point at which the state says, okay, you're going to make investments. You're going to try to derive financial benefit from making those investments. Now's the time when you can afford to make investments for the public benefit at the same time. So that's where the chapter 91 law requires public access along the waterfront. And, and, you know, during the master planning process, a lot of folks talked about just, you know, how much you wanted to see greater public access along this 
uh, river bank. And that's really the way to accomplish it. In, it it's in concert with some redevelopment. So that's, I, I hope that is helpful for question number one, specific remaining residential requirements. So when Darlene put up the, the information about how severely stressed people who spend over 50% of their income on their rent or their mortgage in Beverly, a part of how to address that, it's not the, it, you know, we, we can't solve it on our own in one community, but as part of a regional effort for Beverly to continue to provide additional opportunities for people who want to live here to be able to, which are, you know, over, over time, again, these things aren't perfect. They don't happen uh, easily, particularly when there's such a, uh, a deep shortfall regionally in housing. But the goal is that we do our part as a community within the greater region. And over time and on balance, we see uh, property values where they need to be. And we see rents and mortgage payments kind of leveling and steadying. Um, so that, that's a part of the challenge and a part of the goal. And um, I would suggest that Boston, Worcester, and Springfield cannot absorb all that on their own, nor will they. Um, but we can, you know, we can talk further. There is data we can share with you going forward, Sean and, and other folks. And I think that's, that's a fair um, topic for further conversation. Um, current private owners, Darlene explained that, I think after you typed it in, as an overlay, all current zoning remains allowed zoning. Uh, so people can choose to keep doing what they're doing. Some may choose, some, some we know are already interested in, uh, in selling. Um, because this has been discussed for so long. Do residents get the opportunity to vote on passing these proposals? So as, as, as I think we all know, we don't live in a town where there's a, uh, I guess what you'd call kind of a, a true town meeting, right? Where, where all registered voters in town can come to a town meeting and vote on warrants. As a city, we're a representative form of government. You've got your, your nine city councilors, um, six school committee members by ward, and then the mayor is also a school committee member. And you've got the ability to vote for mayor. So each resident of Beverly gets to vote for their own ward school committee member, ward counselor, three counselors at large, and mayor. And I think you know that that's that's how our city is organized by charter, and that's the opportunity to to uh, to weigh in with people who want to represent you or want to keep representing you, and, and the way to weigh in on issues that you care about. Um, uh, Rich Tabbitt asked about single-use housing being allowed. Darlene, I, I think that's a pretty simple answer. This, this, the, right now, there's no housing at all allowed, and we're proposing multifamily housing and mixed use, which is a combination of multifamily and commercial retail, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I think by single-use, I'm assuming he's referring to single-family. Rich, you want to... I don't, you're muted. I don't know if you can unmute yourself. Chelsea, what, do you want to? What, what, what comment are you looking to, Darlene? Okay, I'm, I'm looking to family. I'm, just asking I'm okay. looking for family. I'm looking for family housing. I mean, in other words, my daughter couldn't afford to live in Beverly anymore. She didn't move out. And I'm just wondering, in other words, I mean, I mean, really, I mean it's family housing. Like, in other words, I guess you're going to put houses together, like multi family housing. My question is, I mean, I guess it'd probably be too expensive. I just wonder if there might be any single family, like family housing, any single family housing there. So, so I guess as families come in all shapes and sizes, right? right. What we've seen to date are largely one and two bedroom uh, apartments, a couple condo developments, mostly apartments in, in this downtown area in terms of newer housing. Um, and so you could see a, a family living in a one or two bedroom. If you're talking about a, a you know a couple of parents and multiple kids, less likely to see that here. Although we you know we do see some families starting here. Um, you, you know you, you don't you don't know what people's preferences are in terms of how how they, you know, it, I would say we talked a little bit about this this morning. More typical in a suburban setting is that when people have kids, they want a yard, they want they want more of a single or two family kind of setting. This is, you know, vertical construction. It's it's denser downtown construction. It's not not necessarily viewed the same way. But but then again, there are people who grew up in more of a downtown 
setting. And so, you know, it's, it's maybe what's been more traditional in Beverly isn't what we necessarily, necessarily will see in terms of who moving forward lives in, in some of this downtown housing. Um, okay. You know, we, we are looking, we do continue to look citywide for, you know, in, in trying to meet our, our housing needs. One of, the, one of the great things about Beverly for generations, and a lot of us have benefited from it, is the ability for people who find this community to choose to make it home. And one thing that I see as, as a real uh, pressure point for a lot of Beverly families is, you know, you, you got a lot of young people who grew up in Beverly who want to come back or want to stay and are trying to find a home. You've got a lot of, uh, a lot of more mature folks in Beverly who are looking to downsize and are having a, it's really hard to stay in Beverly when you, when you're a senior looking for an affordable setting. Um, and, you know, that's, we, we collectively as a community and give a lot of credit to, you know, a lot of other folks, both in this, in this meeting today and, and elsewhere, um, you know, we have strongly supported and are seeing built some, you know, permanently affordable housing for families, for seniors, uh, for individuals who have ex experienced homelessness. And some of that family housing that, that is, you know, now being built at Anchor Point is also for families that have, have or are experiencing homelessness. So there are efforts to address it in multiple forums within the community, right? multiple settings. Why don't we, we can go back to some of what's in the chat, but with, with other folks having their hands up, let's, let's go to them in the meantime. Uh, thank you, Rich. William Welch. Okay. I think Chelsea needs to unmute people. I unmuted myself. Oh, you did. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I just, I, I'm curious about a couple of things. Number one is how is this going to reduce housing prices in Beverly? And, and why is that the goal? Because uh, the market is what the market is. And some of the numbers that you guys are using from the states are pre pandemic numbers. Um, I forget the initials of the study I read, but um, it's something to do with the coalition of all the communities and cities. We had this little board and, and they had a lot of numbers out, but I think those numbers have probably changed due to the pandemic. Um, it would have been nice if we could have had this at City Hall, like, you know, a regular normal meeting and that some of this stuff is kind of major and probably should wait till we open up to public meetings so more people have a chance to uh, speak up. I don't see how it's gonna solve any housing crunch. And when you talk about affordable housing and putting homeless people up, uh, you're not giving us any numbers. So is that number 10, is it number 20 uh, versus how many units are being built? Um, <laughs> I just don't see, it seems like the city's going to spend a boatload of money on this on top of the millions we're going to spend cleaning up Bass River. So I, I just, I'm just curious how that's going to help Beverly. I just, I think we're overdeveloped as it is. And it seems like the master plan carved Beverly up into a bunch of sections where you guys can build these, these big housing developments. And I think you're targeting a transient community um and you, you you're not paying attention to the residential neighborhoods with single family houses i don't see where the benefit is for beverly that's all thanks mr welch um i won't try to answer everything you, you make some comments that probably are, are worth some further conversation with you and others one is in terms of this particular meeting um i'm i'm going to be Weather permitting is it, right now my plan, and I, I don't know if, who wants to take advantage of this, but you know this this is really the beginning of a of a conversation that needs to be ongoing. As I said, over the next few few months, anyway, kind of taking us through the through the balance of the year, uh, working on some of these concerns and questions that come up. Um, one thing that I'm planning to do is go sit at the uh, pavilion at Obear Park next week. I'm going to double check my schedule when I put it in. Um, 5.30 to 7 next Monday evening uh, for anybody. And, and I'll put that out, um, you know, through Rileside Civic. And I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat here, too, if anybody wants to just jot it down. Because I, I agree with you that 
there's much value in being able to, to talk face to face and being able to just converse. Um, a meeting like this, given, given where we are at the moment uh, with the pandemic, and, and I know a lot of people are, are very confident and I'm hopeful and um, knowing the interest in, in having this conversation, um, it just seemed, it made sense to us to do this particular meeting remotely. Um, but I, I very much, I think like you, desire the face-to-face -face conversation. So, um, so that's coming. And, and if anybody wants to have a, a more informal conversation with me and whomever else wants to show next Monday, 5.30 to 7 at Obeer, I'd like to do that. I'm going to try to schedule a similar conversation to have over at Gillis Park on Goat Hill, because look, we recognize that there, as we're as we're trying to address what we see to be a continued need for housing, we recognize that the greatest pressures that people are feeling are coming from neighborhoods that are within the downtown and neighborhoods that are that are most adjacent to the downtown. And that you bring a, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of concerns, I think a lot of legitimate questions. So why don't I just leave it at that and, and we'll move on to the next person, uh, Ben Johnson. Hey, Mike. Hi, everyone. Guys, thanks for all your hard work on the uh, Bass River overlay here. I live up on Woodland Ave. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, looking forward here to hopefully opening this up in the next five to 10 years to gain some public access to the river down there. You know, we also have a really underutilized area behind Incognati Park, behind the skate park, around going, looping up through Green Hill, Mike, you know, the trails behind there and then back all the way to Green Street and then around behind McDonald's and into the Bass River Yacht Club right now is a gorgeous walking trail. The, the um, whatever funds were used to, to build the walkway behind Incognati Park, the lampposts were put in, but the lamps never were, you know, and, and that's a dark stretch. And already we have a draw for people moving to Beverly to utilize that really nice crossing no streets walkway that's been underutilized, it's dark and dangerous in places. And, you know, I feel like, you know, on the short term, that seems like a, like a good investment for the city to make to, to enhance what we already have. I'm just wondering if you guys have a vision over the next year or hopefully sooner to kind of uh, enhance what we already have in the area. So could, could you, then just a little more specifically, where, where you say it's not so well lit, is that the stretch going in behind Stop and Shop? Yeah, well, behind Stop and Shop, you got the Bass River access point um, right. or along the sidewalk. It's dark in both places. Yeah. You also behind the skate park and the community center there, there right. are no lamps put in. They had put the light posts in, you know, years ago, but they never actually put in the posts. So that's a really dark walkway. I mean, it's a beautiful wide walkway, but it, it's really dark there because those light posts are not in or the lamp posts are not in, the, the posts are there. And then, you know, on a, you know, going up through the woods there, you have those trails behind the school um, that now lead all the way to Green Street. And then behind, you know, and then you can stay behind um, Starbucks along the waterfront there and then walk behind McDonald's. I do it every day. And, you know, you're along the water the entire way and it's um, it could be well lit and it could be a safe spot to, to walk and, and is a really nice um, pedestrian walkway. Yeah, no, all, all good. I think um, Chelsea and Darlene and I will we'll take that one back. Um, you know, one of one of our goals with Green Hill has been to make that connection from Bridge Street to Bridge Street right around. Yeah. And we're close, but I, I, I also see the point Eric's making about the, the access through the boatyard, um, which is inconsistent. Um, so yes, we will look back at that. And I, I, I thought things were in a better shape than, than they sound like, but we'll get a look at it. Um, and Mayor, then- you know, I'd also just like to add too, um, that Chelsea, who is on this call under City of Beverly is in the process of taking public comment for our update to our open space and recreation plan that we have to update every six years. Um, and there's a public meeting on that on October 6th, um, which you'll be able to find on our website or Chelsea can post the information in the chat too. Um, so that's another opportunity um, 
and something that could be reflected in there as well to think about, you know, wh what do we need to do to, you know, we can talk about continuing the trail, but how do we make it better? And we're hoping that it would be a better trail. So, um, so as, as Darlene said, Chelsea is, is an assistant planner in the planning department. That's, that's who she is in this call. I, I'm just going to also uh, say, I've gotten a couple of texts from people saying there are those who want to be in the meet, want to get in and can't. This meeting has a limit of 100 people, and, and we made the decision to go with this format because it allows everybody to be on screen and to unmute and talk, whereas a webinar limits that uh, to, to panelists, present, presenters, and, and the, so we, uh, we'd hope that would be sufficient. Please, if anybody's friends are saying they want to be in the conversation, this will be, where are we going to post it, Darlene? Uh, Bev Cam's going to post it on their YouTube channel. I'll put it on our website, too. Um, on the city website, and um, and and as I and as I said, this this is um, this is the first public conversation and this go round of all this, and, and we're going to continue these. So we'll have other opportunities, and we'll make sure of that. Um, and maybe the next time we will do it as a webinar. Just I, the, the webinars feel like it's the public isn't as connected or directly involved in in the conversation. So we we'd hope this was going to be a better way to do it. Mayor, um, do you want us to stop sharing the screen? Yeah, that makes sense. We can get everybody back, back on. Um, all right. So, thank you for that, Ben. Going, um, going back to some of the questions. Let's see. Well, let me ask this. Um, some of what's in here are comments to us, and and we'll save them and look them over. Do any of you want to say any of this out loud? I think Brendan has his hand up. Bre okay. Yes, Brendan Sweeney. Thank you, Mayor Cahill. I appreciated the presentation, and I'm glad to see the city is prioritizing open space and that we have some tools through state law to help essentially leverage our ability to ensure that the area on the waterfront is ultimately open space in the event of redevelopment. Uh, so on that same theme, I know... We promoted mixed use development. This is an area that makes sense to push forth that type of blend between commercial and residential. Um, other than our own encouragement as city officials, are there any real ways to ensure that future development is mixed use in some of these parcels, especially thinking of the Bolomat in particular, or is it ultimately up to the private developer to work within the overlay district? And if they so choose, to develop a mixed use parcel they can do so, but otherwise it's their discretion if they wanna go entirely residential or commercial, or are there tools that we have in addition to the overlay district to really try to take advantage of this opportunity to put some mixed use development right by the train station. Yeah, so what, one of the questions around mixed use development in this, in this area is we, we've had a level of concern for several years that with each, with each new redevelopment of a parcel along, along Rantoul, you've seen a desire by the developer to put a restaurant and a coffee shop on the ground floor. And be that with 70 or 80 or 110 units of new housing in a given development, we, start, we started really getting concerned that you, don't, you aren't necessarily bringing enough new demand for, you know, for a given new type of business with each development. And we also look at the Bass River waterfront and you look and you have to ask yourself the question, how much commercial is there going to be a demand for? And we, we really are, are looking to try to right size that. Right. I mean, look, you know, a given a given property owner who wants to redevelop is going to come with a proposal. Um, I say it's right now there, there's no zoning to allow it. Right. But that's what we're talking about. So. The proposal that we have as draft right now talks about people having the ability to bring forward. A multifamily housing only or a mixed use with multifamily housing and commercial. Right. And one of the things that we've talked, we've been talking about this piece of it for several years. If we try to require ground floor commercial all throughout this area, 
we could cannibalize our own business district. So it really has to be right sized. See what I mean? We have we already have two main streets that are about a mile long each. And we all we also looked at that ground floor requirement along Rantoul and Cabot in, in a um, in an amendment to the ground floor requirements several years ago. So three or four years ago now, Darlene? Yeah, we and, call it our, our active ground floor. Not even, you know, understanding that it doesn't always have to look like a retail use. Um, you know, there are some other things that it's more about how their the spaces are designed to feel open and accessible in public and not necessarily just that they are all retail uses. Um, from the sidewalk, people really, they, people need to feel, and the feeling has to be genuine that they're safe and that, and that those buildings are open and welcoming, even if a given, given ground floor use is for the residents of building only and not actually a, um, you know, commercial retail space that welcomes the public in, correct? And, and we, we require more of that commercial retail on Cabot Rantoul closer to the central part of each street, closer to the depot in Rantoul, mm. closer into the kind of historic retail commercial stretch of Cabot. And further out in each direction, you require less and less of commercial retail on the ground floor, and you may not require any of it further out. And so we, we really are looking for that right formula in terms of commercial, which would be part of any redevelopment here. So let me also just look at a couple of these questions, and then we'll go to Will Cosmos. Um, Jen Cotting, what's the proposed rent versus owner ratio for housing? So this would, this would not require one versus the other or a percentage of one and the other in a given redevelopment. Um, we've seen a couple of condo developments downtown. We've seen many more apartments. Uh, I think it's, it's really a, a, a market-driven dynamic. Uh, if somebody else internally has a thought on that, Darlene or Chelsea. Yeah, we don't use zoning. Um... But we're not allowed to specify whether it can be rent, rental or ownership in zoning. That's that we wouldn't go that far in saying that you know kind of the market dictates you know what's desirable at the time or what the, the certain property owner wants to develop. Yeah. Darlene, let let's jump down to to Jen Cotting's other comment, and then I'll go back and talk about about Hannah's um, question. Do you want to touch on Jen Cotting's question about? Have townhome style condos been considered? It's more aesthetically pleasing versus the quote city large apartment building like we have so many of. Um, I think when we did some build out scenarios we, back in during the master plan, we contemplated whether or not we could support you know, that style of development kind of on the riverside, as the mayor was saying, with the two and a half stories and shorter areas, but maybe with uh, still a commercial use on the ground floor. Um, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, what is feasible given the constraints that exist on these properties and, and what a uh, person who comes, you know, a company that comes in and looks to develop this will want to do and be able to do financially while also taking into account being a resilient building um, and being able to provide public access on the waterfront. So you're certainly generating more units, um, with a multifamily project, um, but we have, so, I mean, we've, we've thought about it and we think we understand how it, it could look nicer on the water edge, but that's kind of the step down that the mayor was talking about. It obviously would not be in the edge because we can't put housing in the, within the water dependent use zone. So it's figuring out the right size, as the mayor said, same thing with the commercial space. You know, what, what could be allowed and what would a developer will, be willing to do and put on that site? Thanks, darling. To you folks who have put the questions and comments in, as we're going, if you've got a follow-up comment or question as we're discussing yours, please feel free to unmute and, and, and jump back in, as long as we get to keep moving through these. Um, so, Hannah, your question is about, yeah, because Darlene characterized the Bridge Street project as a future project. Um, so, what I can tell you is that we have been told recently that we are on the state's funding for federal fiscal year 2023. What that means, the federal fiscal year starts October 1st. So next October, October 1st of 2022, 
That's the beginning of that fiscal year. Right now, we're scheduled to have the Bridge Street project advertised in that winter of 22-23 for construction to begin the summer of 2023. That's two years away. However, whenever there's a big project like this, and, and the thing about the Bridge Street project is, you know, we've spent a good amount of money to design it. And we could not, as a city, fund it on our own. We're spending this year about three and a half million dollars on roads and sidewalks. And that's a high watermark for the city for a long time, if you look back year over year. But the Bridge Street project is in the neighborhood of about $14 million. So we just can't do a project like that with our own funding. You know, it's, so it's a, it's a state project. We got on the state list. We've worked to move up the list. We, you kind of wait your turn, but we're always trying to push that envelope and get be, be ready to jump projects that aren't ready. So what does that entail? Does that in, uh, is that paving? Is that doing like the uh, Rantoul Street kind of whole thing or the Capitol Street project? Is it similar to that? Yes, yes. And, and there's a lot to it. There have been a couple of public meetings in, in, you know, in the last couple of years around, uh, you know, at the beginning of design, at the 25% design. Um, there are, Darlene, I'm not sure because I don't jump on the website daily. If, if what we have for, um, for an update on the, on the Bridge Street project isn't there, let's put it up there so it's easy for people to check on. So, Hannah, what I can tell you is um, the plan right now is with a big project like this, there are things that need to get done first. So National Grid has been through to, to upgrade gas, the gas main. We are going to next year replace a section of the water main that goes down Bridge Street. So the neighborhood will start to see the project happening next year, but the, the, the road reconstruction isn't gonna start till the following year. So we're entering into a construction period along Bridge Street that's gonna be a couple of years long. And you know, it, it's, it'll be in bursts initially, right? It won't be every day for a year, but um, you know, there, there's work that needs doing so that when that road gets reconstructed, and it's not just a, a, a top coat of, of pavement, it's all been re-engineered. Um, there's, there's a, you know, it's going to be taken down. It's going to be regraded. It's going to be new drainage put in, it's going to be curbing put in. There are going to be bike lanes. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of work done with, uh, both with the community, you know, with our engineering department and, and, and my office, the planning department, also with neighbors. And there's a whole kind of long list of takings that need to happen for that project. Now, most of the takings are temporary easements to work in, you know, in somebody's driveway, apron, for example. There are a handful of permanent takings that, that neighbors have been, you know, there's been conversation going back and forth. And that process is, is about to kind of pick up because all that work needs to be done in the coming months. So there's a lot to a project like this. And, and the goal is that it'll be, you know, the, the, the main part of the project will be in construction in 2023. We've been asked and we've put in the, um, in what will be the RFP when it's ready to go out, um, a request that the intersection work at the intersection of River Street and Bridge be done first. That'll be signalized. You know, we, we've heard from uh, neighbors in the Goat Hill neighborhood, particularly, you know, if there's something more that's going to be done down along the Bass River waterfront, please don't do it until you've improved that intersection. So that is a part of the early work on, on that project. There's also a question here about the Hall Whitaker Bridge. That bridge is about 130 years old. It's owned by the state. We continue to try to get the state's attention. Um, I'm hopeful that if the infrastructure, if, if some version of infrastructure gets done at the federal level, the state will be able to do more work on roads and bridges that it owns. Um, the state owns the Kernwood Bridge. The state owns the Hall Whitaker. They're both problematic. They both need to be rebuilt. Um, I'd say preferably not at the same time, but they both need doing, right? Um, so to answer that question, it's not a part of this project. We've asked at several steps along the way, but because the state hasn't had a budget identified for the many bridges it owns that are in need of repair and, or you know, more significantly here, replacement. To try to tie that to the Bridge Street project would just can further delay the Bridge Street project. 
as opposed to us being able to do it, you know, much, much sooner than. And again, if, if the infrastructure funds really come from the federal level, you know, there may be an opportunity to, to kick that into, into gear. Um, the Huffords asked about Sedna. Sedna is a development down at the waterfront on Congress Street. Um, there is, the city has an inclusionary zoning ordinance. Um, please kind of remind me, Darlene, the Sedna project was permitted before the inclusionary zoning ordinance passed because it was permitted right. back in 2006 or seven. Um, are there affordable units in that project? I'm trying yeah. to remember. That, that's right. that's right. there, are, are, there are not. Um, Chelsea, can you mute Bob? So, so no, Sedna couldn't. I mean, Sedna controls the the you know number of units, the what is seventy or so units that you know that are on that property. And as you pointed out, there's no affordability mandate there because it predated the city's ordinance. They did we, make a contribution even before we had the ordinance to the affordable housing trust fund um, in lieu of having inclusionary units. Um, but we do require in all future projects that 12% of the units be affordable at 80% of area median income or 10% of the units, uh, sorry, 8% of the units at 60% of area median income, or they can do a half. We find that more recently, we've been getting more people coming in at 8% of the units affordable to those earning 60% of the area median income. Um, so reaching a, a lower uh, income bracket, but still, um, you know, still meaningful creation of housing. And so that will apply to this future overlay district as well. And, and since you mentioned the, the, the Affordable Housing Trust and Mr. Welch had earlier asked about the numbers on some of the subsidized affordable development, let me just say the family affordable housing that is being built uh, on the hillside above the high school at the corner of Sawyer and Toza Roads, it's being funded in two phases by the state. The first phase is under construction the total in the two phases will be, I think, 77 units um, and about 20 some odd of them, 20, call it 20. Somebody else will have to give you the exact number, but I can give you the, the close to number. About 20 of those units are going to be for families that are currently um, homeless or, or at risk of homelessness. And that so those units will be under 30 percent of area median income and the remaining 60 or so high 50s are going to be all under 60% of area median income. Uh, so, you know, targeted more for uh, a, a workforce housing model. So that's the, that's the family housing there. The senior housing at Briscoe, that project will be 85 units. And I think about 18 of them are gonna be under 30% and the remainder under 60 or under 50? Uh, 50. Under 50% 50 of area median income. And those, that's 55 plus. Um, I think it's more likely to be people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. But, um, but that is, those are subsidized. Those are permanently affordable. Um, and as part of the Briscoe project, there's going to be a, a renovation as well of down where the gymnasium is currently. And I believe that's where the artist live workspace is going to go. Is it artist live work or artist work? There'll be, there'll be six artist live work units. Right, down in that part of the building. And, the, and then the, the, um, um, the auditorium will be uh, preserved as well. So that's a great project. And then the, the project at the Cabot Street Y, there are currently 45 single room occupancy units. Single room occupancy means you share uh, bathrooms, um, like dormitory style and you share kitchen space. Those are being renovated to studios. So there'll be true apartments, those 45 and an additional 23 units are being built. And those 20, 22, I think, additional 22 units, and I believe it's nine of them are going to be for adults living um, on the autism spectrum, adults with autism. And those will be supported units uh, as well as the balance of those 22 new will be people who have experienced homelessness and their, their units will come with supportive services, that being you know, staff supportive services. Um, so those are three really necessary and, and I think outstanding projects that the community at large and you know, through your elected officials on the city council and me and uh, you know, working with a number of 
uh, you know, wonderful for, uh, not-for-profit organizations in the community have made happen. Um, why don't I keep moving? I hope that's helpful as a, as a bit of detail there. Um, uh, Michael Hakeem, do you want to speak to this or just you, you want to want me to say it aloud? Just, you just want it to land as a, as a comment for us to consider? Yeah, I, I mean, I would like you to discuss it, Mayor. I, I, you know, I think, I guess just as a general comment, mm -hmm. um, this is a once, probably a once in a lifetime, certainly once in my lifetime, mm -hmm. opportunity for a very prime piece of property uh, in the city due, due to its proximity to the downtown, the train, and the waterfront. And, you know, I, I, I think that a full rezoning is something that needs to be seriously considered um, uh, that that could be accompanied by a city program to assist those existing property owners who choose not to be in, in a uh, uh, non-conforming use based be, because of that rezoning. I think, you know, we what we're doing by making it an overlay is kind of hitting a single or a double when we have an opportunity to hit a home run. And uh, if, you, if you end up doing it as an overlay, you're gonna get some participants and, and some who do not participate. And that's just gonna promote incompatibility and the lack of cohesiveness of the development. And that's really the, the crux of my comment there. Okay. No, I appreciate that, Michael. Maybe that's, um... That, that sounds like a longer conversation. Um, with a rezoning, make sure I understand you, with a rezoning, what's currently there would become pre-existing non-conforming, right? And so there would be a different, different dynamic at play for any future investments they make on those existing uses versus what they can do in an overlay. That, that's correct. But... Um you need to be cognizant and sensitive to those existing property owners and businesses by offering them an opportunity to be, to, to either adjust their business model or to be relocated to a more uh, appropriate location in the city with city assistance. But it, it, it's a, like I said, it's a once in an opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity to do something really dynamic for the city. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, um, Benjamin. I don't see your full last name. We'll do this question, then we'll go to Will. Uh, why one parking spot per residential unit? Why not less to encourage commuters? Um, so there's a lot. There's there's been a lot of back and forth and debate amongst um, planners, both our city planners and others who we've worked with as as consultants and brainstormed with us. Um, when the city went with, when the city left for the uh, tall building overlay district, when the city left the requirement of uh, two spaces per unit or one space per bedroom, whatever it was back then, and required one space per unit, there was a lot of concern that that wouldn't be enough. What we've done, what prior to COVID, we had um, performed an uh, an, an assessment of the several TOD projects along Rantoul and what we saw for cars. And we went through how many registered vehicles there were at these addresses through the assessor's office. And we saw that we were under one per unit. Um, I think it was about 0.87 or 0.92. I think there were two different measurements. It was taken at two different times. Um, but we were you know, slightly under one space per unit. Um, we're, we're trying, like, like with other things, Benjamin, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get the language right because we, we certainly want to attract people who may move in and choose not to have a car. And maybe they prefer to have a zip car membership or some other, you know, some other uh, car share or, or ride share kind of option, or perhaps, a, you know, a couple that may uh, choose to have one car between them. Um, we certainly want to encourage that as much as possible, while not, you know, not misfiring on on what we 
uh, require uh, and, and what, you know, what actually lands? Because we, we know to date that TOD doesn't mean no cars. So that's, I think that's one of the challenges is, is to get that right in, in, a, um, in words you put on paper that you're looking for the right outcomes from. So uh, if, if you got more to share on this with us, I'd love to hear it. Uh, so, you know, you and, and any, anybody and everybody in this conversation, we, we are looking for input, not just here tonight, but as we go forward with the conversation. Uh, let's turn to Will Cosmas. Will? Hello. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Darlene, for your presentation as well. Um, uh, the one concern that's been brought to me um, about uh, this planned zoning overlay, it, mostly because my, my wife plays softball at Innocenti Field and so does my daughter. Um, and this may dovetail with the open spaces and recreation meeting. Um, so forgive me if I'm if I'm stepping on that at all, but is there any, has there been any thought given to how we preserve parking for people who want to use that area? I, I, it goes towards public access in general and in, uh, and access to those fields in particular, especially for a number of people um, uh, who, who use those fields on a regular basis. Um, yes. Um, so, so the, you know, two questions that we, we keep, we keep needing to work on are parking and our congestion. Right. So the question you have is really, really specific to a lot of folks who want to, you know, enjoy the use of Anasanti Park. So, Darlene, why don't I why don't I ask you to field that one? Because, you know, you've talked this over with um, with folks who've got an interest in the former Bolomat property. And, and you know what's public and what's private in terms of existing parking down there. Well, for the most part, the parking down there is private. Um, the, the places that people currently park largely to use the recreation fields, um, and I play too, so play, um, are on privately owned property uh, aside from the on-street parking. Um, and I think the parking that has, has been there is you know, at the will of prior owners and, and current owners, um, but it shows a need. Um, and, I, and I think there's an opportunity to create with with redevelopment and kind of improving the street edge of these properties, there's an opportunity to create additional on-street parking. Um, so it's not an, it, you're not losing all of those spaces. Um, there's also, I think, you know, requires looking at where else can we park in the area, you know, if we're sharing uses or, you know, for example, Games that happen on the weekends or in the evenings, is there an opportunity to um, work with the depot train station or other place where we can have shared parking arrangements? And, and what's a reasonable expectation for like, walking to parking? I mean, certainly um, even parking is not allowed within the 100 foot water dependent use zone. So it's probably a good thing. I mean, we don't really want to parking on the waterfront. Um, we do have a parking lot essentially on the waterfront now, but um, so it, it is something that, you know, as this kind of plays out, we have to think about where those opportunities and, and we're thinking about it in other locations too, as it's been noted in comments, you know, where there's, you know, and it, there's parking constraints that we're trying to address down in Goat Hill and down by the other waterfront. So how do we make sure that people can access our open spaces and, and park there and use them efficiently, but not also um, you know, have a lot of parking lots lying around that aren't the most attractive uses of, of our city space. So, um, and Mayor, I did want to mention too, I mean, one of the other things that came up, this is not about this, but you know, we also talked about looking at the youth center too and making some improvements there. So that could yep. be related. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Well, you know, we're, we're looking at that. That's a whole different conversation in that we're looking at the need for some capital investments and improvement in, in the McPherson Teen Center for our, for our kids. Um, I think the reason Darlene mentions it is, is when we look at the, um, the climate impacts along the river, the riverfront and the need to ensure that any, any redevelopment in the area we're talking about, which only goes up river as far as the bowl of that parts um, would be done in a way that's consistent with protecting the whole of the river, the river bank uh, from, from any kind of flooding concerns. Um, 
So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Will. Um, Jen Cotting, is it known how many units are currently available in the Rantoul Street apartment buildings? I, I don't have any any intel or knowledge if there's a problem with any of those buildings. I think they they rent. I think their 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 vacancy rates are, are are fairly low. I think they you know they people come and stay. Some people go. They turn over. Um, but since you asked, Darlene, let's just check in with some of the some of the owners of those properties and see how they're doing. I believe one of the owners of the properties put an answer in the chat. Okay, all right. And then we'll keep scrolling see we get through. <laughs> um, Eric, and I don't wanna get your last name wrong, Eric Vasey, um, any plans for mitigating traffic congestion uh, that this development will certainly create? Direct access to Rantoul or lights at Bridge Street and other major points of access. Since you put that in, I, you probably heard me say that that the Bridge Street, River Street intersection is going to be signalized as part of the Bridge Street, Bridge Street project. Um, and then, you know, we've done a lot of work around the community at intersections. We've done the, the two roundabout project over at uh, Sawyer and, and, and Brimble coming off the highway. We've done the roundabout in Centerville. The three intersection project that's currently under construction at Henry's at the Golf and Tennis and down at the foot of the um, Beverly Salem Veterans Memorial Bridge. Um, we are also, and, and this is one that you've heard some talk about maybe, but, but it's, it's coming closer to being to actually happening. So let me say that um, we have awarded a contract for somebody to build a traffic light at along Route 62 at Elliott Street and Echo Ave. We're going to, when it's, we're going to, when it's done, we're going to remove that uh, pedestrian cross light at Starbucks, and we're going to put a full intersection, a fully signalized intersection at Echo and Elliott that includes a um, an exclusive pedestrian crossing sequence. So the ability, and, and one of our big motivations there has been really the, it's not it's not e easily solved, but we, we're, we're very hopeful and have confidence that this will. Um, will begin to really allow uh, families who live on the um, Shingleville side of Route 62 for their kids to walk to school at Ayers and for the kids who live on the Ayers side of Route 62 for their kids to be able to walk to the middle school. Um, and, and certainly for a whole lot of other good reasons that people want to and need to cross Route 62 there uh, from those neighborhoods. So, um, and the reason I mentioned that the intersection work generally is that when it's done right, and, and we think it's been effective in the places that, you know, that, that I've been around for in my now almost eight years as mayor, um, it, it really does improve safety for everybody who uses the roads. And it does a better job of moving more vehicles through on each cycle. Uh, and, and one of the big changes in technology, this is no mystery or any big thing to people paying attention, right? A lot of the technology that was used for light sequencing 25 years ago was, was um, loops that were installed under the pavement. And the technology that's, that's widely in use now is rather than that is camera technology that's mounted. And that camera technology is all, um, you know, the software that, that, that's produced allows the, the intersections to be quote, smarter intersections. And, you know, if you've got a less traveled a uh, piece of, of a signalized intersection and nobody's waiting to come out, well, then maybe that gets skipped in a cycle. And so the other directions get more cars through more quickly. Um, and then that camera, th those cameras can read backups and, and you know, and can, um, can um, hasten or, or, you know, move to, a, move to a, a green for that direction more quickly. So that type of technology is a part of the work we're doing. We also, and, and I, I didn't think to mention this, but the other intersections won that stretch of Route 62, McKay Street, Center Drive at Cummings, McPherson Drive, and Beckford are all being upgraded in terms of that same equipment. It's not a construction project, it's the signalization that is being updated and improved. So a lot of work going there, which among other things, we, we have a lot of, a, a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm for it being able to move traffic more effectively. Um, so hopefully that all helps. 
Will the develop, developers be required to provide public open space? So we've talked about the waterfront, chapter 91 requirements. Darlene, could you touch on the, you know, the other, um, anything else that's, that would be part of the proposal on, on the balance of a given parcel? Uh, we had a we had a condition in the prior zoning draft that I mentioned, which was 10% of the site to be dedicated as, as open space. We have that in our existing zoning. We call it recreational area. Um, and then it, you know, the, it's these lots are going to be owned by, so the, even the open space is going to be owned by the private developer. We're, they're not, at this point, the city's not planning on taking that ownership. So they would be responsible for creating the open space and the useful, um, the meaningful access in that water dependent use zone. Somebody mentioned the Sedna project in regards to this as well. The Sedna project is an example of a project that was subject to chapter 91 waterways regulation. If you've been down there um, at the base of the bridge, the base of Congress street, um, it's a really lovely walkway um, and and they were, that was part of their chapter 91 licensing process. They were required to put that in. Um, yeah, I think they did a great job on it and maybe not everybody would do such a great job. And so there's a way that the city can, you know, express what we would like to see there and hopefully work with future developers to create something that is contiguous and meaningful. Um, Cause that is one of the challenges of this not being all under one ownership um, I think I did see another comment related to that too. It, it could, it may not all be developed at the same time. It could be choppy. Um, we want to make sure that we have a clear vision for what the best uh, outcome of, of that is from an open space perspective. Thanks, Darlene. Um, Lori Smith's comment, our city plans do not address enough impact on police, fire, and DPW. Our services are not growing as fast as our number of residents. Um, we, uh, we have done a little bit of work on this. Um, we have a, a, a couple of years ago, we received a, a grant from the state um, because of the housing creation that we were doing. Uh, and it was a, a fiscal impact tool that we created. And so we actually have the ability to um, analyze, basically en enter the number of units that are anticipated or the number of uh, commercial square feet that are anticipated and then generate what the income, what the output is on various public services. Um, it's a proprietary tool. It's not something that I can share, but there's, I can share the outcome of it. Um, and it takes a little bit of work to I have to update the inputs and things like that, but it is a tool that we can use. Um, generally, the impact of um, fire and police uh, is less in a, in a multifamily project than a single family. Uh, you know, for example, kind of driving to, having to get to a call um, further out takes them away from their, their base. So if they have to go all the way out to my house in Centerville, then they <laughs> take some longer, but there, there is some data on that. Um, and we've also done some analysis on um, schools. Um, and the generation of school children in multifamily projects versus uh, single family uh, subdivision type development. So, so uh, thanks, Darlene. Couple of things. We are, as I said, we're going to update our, our count of registered vehicles in these, uh, in, 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 in the several TOD buildings in the downtown. We're going to do the same on the, on the uh, number of kids enrolled in the public schools because that's come up a few times. We did a couple counts on that a few years ago, and one was 34. I'm sorry, one Beverly public school child for every 34 units of housing. And the other uh, follow-up was closer to 40 units of housing. Um, but these are worth updating because I think they're, they're data points that, that matter. Um, and, and everybody has a, a, you know, they're, they're the same kind of questions that come up again and again. To Lori's point, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you that I agree with you. We, we want more staffing in all three of those departments. Um, we have twice in the last nine years, because the first grant was, um, was secured before I became mayor, um, but we've twice in the last nine years now increased our fire department staffing by four firefighters through um, uh, a federal uh, Homeland Security grant. And so each, each time that's been one additional firefighter per group. There are four groups um, or four shifts of firefighters. 
Uh, and so we've been able to increase that uh, by two. That also was particularly this last grant helped us to make the decision to buy a ladder truck where the city had not had a ladder truck in about 20 years. The ladder trucks require greater staffing level than the quints that have been used. And so now our, our ladder truck and our new pumper truck that, that, you know, thanks to everybody who pays taxes in the city and thanks to the city council that supported expending money on these things. And thanks to, to Chief O'Connor who did great and, and his predecessor, Chief Cotter, who before he retired really made this stuff happen. We, we've got that new equipment for the fire department and it was really the downtown buildings that had the firefighters and the department really making the case that we, we need the ability to get a little higher with our ladders. Um, so, you know, good, good point you're making, Lori, and we are working to address those same uh, concerns. Uh, Jane Knight, yes, thank you for this comment. Um, I, I will tell you that as soon as we're able to get a date together for me to come to Gillis and have a, a conversation with the, the Goat Hill neighborhood, I want to do that. Um, and this is an important point for us to, to have in mind as we, you know, as we shape what we'd like to put forward as a proposal. Um, because yes, I mean, it, it obviously it, it, it's critical to the neighborhood. Um, do you want to say anything else, Jane? Any, as I said, anybody who's got a comment in here who wants to follow up, just unmute and, and, and um, you know, share more. Michael, we already spoke in this, this follow-up, I think you had already put in the box before, before we talked. So I appreciate that. Um, Deb Debsky, um, yes, yeah. Um, the Beverly Depot is one of the three or four busiest train stations in the system. I say the system, I could say in the state, but it includes the Providence, Rhode Island station. So the, the commuter rail system, the, um, Beverly Depot is one of the top busiest stations. It also is on, it's on the list for the state to invest in electrifying um, the Newburyport Rockport line up to Beverly Depot. Now, before COVID, that looked like it was going to happen on a pretty quick time frame, uh, you know, five years or so. And that when it happens, because I believe the future of rail is going to be electric, it's going to be light, high-speed rail that's clean and that's frequent. And when it does happen, that transportation is going to be, is going to support even better the transit-oriented development in this neighborhood. Because when that does come, what you'll see is instead of 36 or 37 minutes into North Station from Beverly Depot, you'll see a 22 to 25-minute trip into North Station. And if the investments that were recommended by the Rail Visioning Committee, which met for a couple of years. I was a, a member of that uh, a committee that the state put together to, to really envision the future of the, of the commuter rail. If they do it the way it's been recommended, they'll also add a station in Revere so that you could take the train from your neighborhood uh, train station in Beverly, get off at Revere, take one of those airport moving walkways over to the blue line, take it to the airport, a shuttle bus to your terminal. And there'll be a, an option to get in and out of the airport without driving, uh, which is pretty much how everybody has to get there today. Um, I, I don't mean to get sidetracked, but Deb's point is the Beverly Depot is not the only station in Beverly. There needs to be some uh, transit oriented development in at the other stations. I would say that the state has discontinued service at the Pride's Crossing station, or at least slated that to be discontinued. So we are talking about three other stations, North Beverly, Montserrat, and Beverly Farms. And I and we have we talked a lot during the master planning process about looking to those stations in the surrounding neighborhoods for, the, for again, right-sized type of housing opportunities. Um, wouldn't I don't think they would or will look like the ones. Um, along Rantoul Street have looked. Uh, and there are half as many trains at those stations because the line splits just north of the depot. I think that once, um, once the improvements are made in, in the, you know, once the modernizations to electrify and increase service are made right up the line, then you'll see more viability for more, to support more housing in those neighborhoods or adjacent to those stations. 
that won't happen right away, um, in part because the state is not initially planning to electrify up through the other Beverly stations to the rest of the line. And so for the transit to be robust enough to support more housing in those by those stations, there's still some work to do. But it is a relevant point, Deb. And I think when, when you look ahead, it's something that will be part of uh, future master plans and, and future conversations and efforts in the community. Yep, Will, we got that question. You talked about it. And Deb's follow-up comment. Yep, thank you. Um, Mayor, just while you're looking to, I just wanted to, I meant to say this earlier, this isn't the only way we're looking at, um, you know, providing new housing opportunities. The mayor, you know, addressed some others, uh, projects that are going on that are affordable, but we're also looking at our accessory dwelling unit ordinance, um, something that we're involved in the project with MAPC, um, which will really come to light kind of later in the year and next year and be a, a community driven project at that point. Um, and then, you know, there's other recommendations in the master plan for, you know, small infill opportunities or smaller scale, scale development. You know, where can we accommodate housing growth um, in different locations in the city, but while also not losing the valuable open space areas that we have, the, the undeveloped areas. Okay, thanks, Darlene. Um, why don't we go to Councillor Rand and then Mr. Liebert, if I pronounce that right, Councillor? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Darlene, and um, all the members of the planning department that are here tonight, um, and all of the people who have been commenting. It's been really interesting to see the variety of, of focus from even just the 100 people who were in attendance tonight. Um, and I can see that the you know, the Bass River rezoning, when I first got elected, I remember the outgoing planning department, um, the outgoing city planner handed me a pile of maps and said, good luck with this. And it was her, her version of the Bass River rezoning. So that was, you know, it's been decades in, in the works. Um, that doesn't really make it easier for me to uh, be excited about rezoning the Bass River just as the Ward 2 counselor. I have some concerns, I guess, related to transportation that are that we I would really like to see our city do better with making public transportation um, just a little more inviting and um, useful. I think we've talked before about things like kiosks for or, you know, shelters for bus stops and things like that and, and really working to try and get um, local transportation improvements that don't relate to cars. So I, I really liked Jordan's comment in the thread, um, really sort of bringing to mind that if we're, if we're making room for more cars, then we're just going to have more cars. And I know that's tricky in terms of parking, but I, it's not tricky in terms of um, some of the work that we prioritize with intersections and roads and things I, that's important work, but I, there seems to be an imbalance. And so I'm concerned that going forward with big projects like this, um, we're not also taking care of, of the, the aspects of our city that could alleviate some of the concerns like congestion and traffic. So that's sort of just a one concern I have. Um, and then I know I've been really transparent with you, Mayor and Ms. Wynn, about that I would like to see these other opportunities for adding housing to the city before we see rezoning on the Bass River. I would like to see accessory dwelling units come into play in Beverly. Um, I would just like to see a bit of a spreading out of that opportunity for housing in the other wards. I think um, we've done some really good work in um, as a as a community supporting the development on Rand Tool Street, but I think that there's a lot of fatigue, and you you've obviously seen that. We've all sort of seen that in public meetings and things like that, but. Um, 
I think we also, not only is there fatigue, but we need different types of housing. It, it concerns me that we're looking at adding more really high-end apartments. I mean, I think, you know, $3,000 a month is, um, a, it's a lot for a lot of people. And I'm not sure that that has the economic impact that we're looking for in our community right now. So those are, I think, economic impact and um, just sort of how we're managing moving forward with like city infrastructure, maintaining city infrastructure and progressing with infrastructure to alleviate some of these big concerns. So those are my comments for tonight, but I, I'm, I'm glad there'll be future meetings. And I appreciate you involving the public. I, I hope at our next opportunity, we can have a meeting that doesn't have to limit people, um, people's attendance. Though I totally understand you wanna see faces and, and have participation. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Councilman. And, and, and it's all to be continued, right? This is all ongoing. I appreciate your, your perspective. Um, and yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to find and make apologies to people who weren't able to get in, but we, we really were um, looking for this much of an easy interaction. And um, at any rate, a little bit underestimated how many people wanted to be in the conversation, I guess, in, in hoping that uh, the hundred person limit with the ability for people to just mute, unmute, speak, share uh, was gonna be the right model. It's a hot topic. Yes, yes. And, and people spread the word, which is nice. It's good when it works like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I do, you know, I'm glad that there will be more opportunity. And I think, did, did you share sort of your sense of timeline already with? Yes, yeah. And, and thanks, Councillor. Councillor Rand and Councillor Feldman, I, I think, were able to get into the meeting shortly after Darlene started or right around in that window of time. And so, I didn't get to acknowledge you right up front. We, as you know, we've talked about this a lot and, and uh, we had, once the master plan, the new master plan really reaffirmed this as a, as a priority opportunity given the housing needs of the community uh, and the new growth needs. Um, we really were looking to do this this year with, with this city council and, and you know, in this period of time, but a lot of the work to prepare what the proposal might look like um, was delayed for various reasons, COVID being one, but, but trying to be thorough and, and working with the, um, the MICD grant, we got the Mayor's Institute for City Design grant where we were able to access some really um, incredibly, you know, incredibly talented um, um, advisors who worked through that grant process with us. It really, it, it, it just has placed us where it makes most sense to use this fall to work through um, the, the concerns and what things might look like and, and look to have the next council and the next mayor. And I know several of us wanna be part of that conversation as elected officials, but you know, for this to be something that happens more early next year, um, because it, it just, it, it would be at this point, it would be rushed and that's not what this needs. So this, this is why, you know, this being the first public conversation about this in a while, it, it became clear that this needs to be a process that we take the next you know, few to several months to undergo. So, um, all right, let's, so Mr. Liebert, and then I see Councillor Ames would like to share as well. Mr. Liebert. Thank you. Um, I've enjoyed the presentation so much so far, and um, I wanted to bring up a subject that perhaps hasn't been, uh, hasn't been raised, um, which is the, uh, uh, when you have to deal with the, uh, the future of storm surges up the Bass River, uh, it would seem to me that uh, at some point one has to worry about um, the effect on the Area 91 uh, region that you're, you're dealing with in terms of, uh, of what that would do. And also, um, if there's ever going to be any mitigation uh, installed near the Bridge Street Bridge uh, over there um, in terms of, say, a floodgate or something similar, um, would that uh, potentially change a lot of the usage right near the Bridge Street that's uh, contemplated? 
or for even further down? Um, and how would any of these surges uh, wipe out some of these plans for further down? Thank you. Great, thank you. And we are in the process of, of um, working to engage a, uh, an engineering firm to work with us on, on the, what, what we're most likely to see folks in terms of flooding is, is, you know, with sea level rise, it's a storm surge, high tide kind of flooding um, that, you know, that, that the banks of the Bass River would be most vulnerable to. Um, and so we've been, it took us a while um, to get access to, I think just because the process um, was still ongoing, the 2070 projections for sea level in this area. And because, you know, if this area is to be redeveloped, nobody wants it to be something that we have to retreat from. And that's the term that's being used, right? Retreat from in 20 or 30 years because, you know, we miscalculated and built in a way that shouldn't have been, or not, we, we're not going to do any of the building if it does happen, but you know what I'm saying? So we now have the 2070 sea level projections to work with, and we were engaging with somebody to come in and, you know, really take a good comprehensive look at how this river would be protected, how, how, how the banks and people living and, and you know, residences and businesses and infrastructure um, on the land side of the banks, and in some cases, which is lower than um, you know, the river level, how it gets protected. And so there's, you know, as, as, as I believe, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can look to protect waterfronts, you know, be they hard barriers, be they floodable spaces and, and natural treatments. And so those are, those are the things that we've already spent time looking at. And those are the things that this, this um, consultant will start to work with us on. And it'll become part of the conversation with all of you as we start to learn more and, and see what might be, you know, what might be recommended steps to take. Um, this is an important waterfront, clearly, um, to get right and whether that, you know, whatever that right looks like. And, and I, I would say that people with 100 people in this meeting, there are, you know, a number of different perspectives on what that means. But, um, you know, when, when you're across the street from uh, a, a major transit station, when you, you know, you could stand on the sidewalk on River Street with a decent arm, hit the train with a tennis ball. I say tennis ball because we wouldn't throw a baseball at it, but, you know, it, so, um, and, and, you know, so there's a lot of time that's worth spending on this. And that's what we're trying to, to do, what, what we spent a lot of to date. And now with, you know, bringing it to the public uh, phase of the conversation. So that answer your question for now? But please for now yeah, it's it's really a promise to answer it in the future yeah yeah and and happy to happy to discuss it with you you, you know you, you clearly have a both an interest and in, i'm guessing some level of expertise in in these areas so so uh, happy to talk with you further about it um thank you counselor hello good evening Hi. everyone it's great to see 100 people on a call that's for sure um, I just, ha I have two really informational, just questions about the project that I think, um, I'd love to have you talk about a little bit. The first we have at the council behind closed doors and in limited time had a couple of conversations about dredging or not dredging the ba Bass River. And obviously this would have impacts. Development may have impacts on the river. And whether we dredge or can dredge or can't dredge, you know, that will have impact on the development. So that's the first question that I was hoping you might discuss. And the second one is a little thornier, but I'm happy to see you're reaching out to a lot of people. And I would imagine that there are some developers that have probably crossed your path in the past, you know, six months to a year about this. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if that had happened and, um, how those conversations may be informing your um, the zoning uh, the zoning decisions that you're making. Mm -hmm. So that's so, it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Councilor. So first, oh, the 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 dredging. Yeah, I mean, we we as I think people know, I hope you know, 
we, we thought we were going to dredge the river a couple of years ago. And then the, the federal, the, the Army Corps of Engineers who had granted a permit to dredge, revoked it at the last minute, literally at the last minute when, when we had um, contracted with a, with a dredge company based on their permit. And, um, and then they refused to give the coordinates for dumping the material. And then they told us, well, we made a mistake, we being the Corps, we should not have given you the permit and we've got to revoke it because the materials in the, in the, in the uh, riverbed in the channel aren't clean enough to be dumped at the open water uh, dumping site offshore in Massachusetts. So we've since secured a, a state grant to, um, to examine feasibility of creating a CAD site. Simply put, a CAD site is you, you try to find a, a place under the riverbed where there's an ability to dig out clean fill, clean dirt that is under the water and under the riverbed. You take the clean fill and you can dispose of that easily. And then that hole in the ground under the river, you take the dirty fill and you put it in and then you cap it and it's, and it's not gonna get out. And so that, that's a, a, a process that's used up and down the, the sea coast, the, the coast and probably all over the world. Um, so we're looking at whether we can find a, a place either within the river itself or within the city's coastal waters where there's an appropriate site. If there is, it's a process that, that, that you know, to, to actually uh, permit and then um, I say build, excavate one, there's a price tag that we don't know yet. And so that would be a feasibility too on, on the financial. And then we'd have to chase grant money if we're gonna try to do that. Um, given that the Bass River hasn't been dredged in 70 years, there's, there, you know, we've recognized for a number of years, there's a real value and a need to doing it um, for a number of reasons, not the least of which are, are the commercial fishermen in the river and, and the, uh, the recreational boaters in the, winter, in the river as well. Um, so that's one. And then the question of developers, you know, there, there have been a few people who've come our way in recent years looking at the Bolomac property. And when we told them, we were going through a master planning process and we didn't know what the outcome of it would be, they left. Um, more recently, somebody has bought the property and they're, you know, they're, they're a company that is looking to uh, redevelop the bowl mat and the uh, service station next to it. So everything, everything except the, the gas station, which they don't own, um, into housing. And you mean a car wash, sorry. What did I say? Gas station. It is oh, of. sorry about that. Um, so, you know, they have an interest in doing that. They're, I think, you know, they're taking a, a, a leap of faith that there will be a, a, an overlay or a rezone. Um, you know, that's, that's not something that, you know, ultimately any one of us has control over. That's a process that we're undergoing here, right? Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're a group that has an interest in doing something there. And we've met with them several times to understand what they're thinking and to make sure that they understand what, what a proposal may look like here. Um, and I, I do believe, well, one, this, this proposal is not about zoning for any developer or any, any proposal um, that's come before us. It is interesting, and maybe I think thus far it's been helpful to have, have somebody to talk with who is actually um, has site control of a property and wants to do something with it. Because we, you know we've we've had some interesting conversations, um, and I think it's helped it's helped us understand too. Um, I don't know if that if that's helpful to to you. No, question. no, that sort of is. So it, it sounds like. And I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing that you in talking to this entity that has bought the um, Bolomat property that obviously they'd want to share. And to an extent, I would assume the city would want to hear what was probable and what was practical and what was maybe not so helpful. So just back to the um, dredging issue, because you know you and I have had a couple of conversations even about that offline. And I, you know, representing Ward 3, I worry about just the drainage even from the streams up for, that dump into the Bass River. I worry about, you know, and I also worry about um, just the health and condition of that river over time. And so, you know, 
it definitely will have an impact. And whether it's a flooding impact, whether it's an economic impact, an environmental impact, um, there's going to be something. And I would think that perhaps a piece of this is the city itself trying to make a commitment one way or another surrounding dredging because it's one of those things 20, 30 years down the road. And I know it's, it's a bear to try to do it. And we've been trying to do it for the better part of a century, right? It's not an easy one, mm -hmm. but I think we as a city totally need to have, take some leadership, you know, one way or another as part of this plan Right. to figure out which way we're going to go and how that fits into whatever happens. And, and I appreciate Councillor Rand's comments just about spreading it out, just because I think even um, there's just a parity across the city, you know, but again, this is, you know, as someone else said, a once in a lifetime opportunity to really make a considerable difference in this part of the city, you know, if we can do this thoughtfully and in a forward thinking kind of way. So, I, and thanks very much for this meeting. I, I, I think the value in it and the participation across the city is phenomenal, just phenomenal. So thank you. Thanks counselor. And, and we'll do it again um, for sure. Uh, uh, then Hannah Bowen is the last hand I see up and we'll probably need to wrap in the next few minutes. But before we go to Hannah, I'm looking to Jane Knight's comment. Is the city already in conversations with developers? And if so, how can we get access to this information? I would say Jane and anybody else, you know, th there's an owner of record here. They, they're not going to hide. They, they bought it. They have an interest in, in, a, in a redevelopment that's residential. Um, we, you know, Darlene and I are happy to talk with anybody about the conversations we've had and, you know, how that, how we've spoken with this team about, hey, you know, there, there, there were values that we brought out of the master planning process. And that is, you know, lower height than we've seen with the tall building developments on Rantoul. It's ensuring better design standards and aesthetics. Um, it's, it's addressing um, the affordable housing piece of it, which, are, which is in our inclusionary zoning ordinance and, and others. So, you know, we, we've had these conversations, happy to talk with any of you about them. Um, and, you know, of course, this group, which I, I find thus far to be, you know, reputable and honorable in, in how they're looking at things, um, you know, they can't do any of this with the zoning as it stands today. So it's, you know, it, it, it may or may not come to pass. I, you know, I believe that, um, I do believe that the, the range of needs that can be addressed here make this worth pursuing and and the concerns you're raising you know need attention as we're working through it so anyway enough said by me uh, for now hannah why don't you share what you've got and then if and if nobody else has anything tonight will will to be continued this conversation hannah sure and actually that that last comment hopping up is probably a good one to to address too um yeah i i just wanted to say a big thank you and i think this is you know the attendance and energy around this is evidence that it's something we all as a community have an interest in and and want to discuss so just wanted to put in a plug for really continuing this maybe along the same model as the master plan process itself where I think there were really creative ways of getting people thinking in small groups and big groups in different parts of the city. I know we're not going to replicate that full process for each component of the plan that we now tackle, but bringing in some of those principles, I think, will be really, really helpful. And for this process in particular, I think, especially if we're trying to have this conversation as a city from now into next winter, spring, um, thinking about you know, I am really excited about those those principles that came from the master plan about the open space, about you know public access, about creative mixes of types of residential and types of commercial that we don't currently have downtown, um, and more diversity of, of housing and commercial uses in that space. So I'm excited by that on paper and in principle, but as we go through the process of actually seeing 
where the, the current draft thinking is in terms of actual language and ordinance and think about translating that into like, how does this check all of the boxes in those principles and pulling in some of the data that, that you have from those tools to look at economic impact, impact on services and really using these meetings or other meeting formats um, in the most effective way so that you know the, the hundred or more people who are interested can see some of that data in advance can then hear a presentation about how to interpret it and what it means, because we're, we're not all city planners, but can benefit from your expertise. Um, and then have the conversation in a focused way, because there are so many different components of it. So we can have a conversation on affordability, on the you know environmental impact, things like that. So you know if we get into a regular cadence of those kind of meetings, so people know they're coming up, know they're predictable, and know they're going to be informed by progress from one meeting to the next, I think it could be a really, really powerful process overall. Great, right. thank you, Henry. I think great points. Um, so folks, if we're good for now, then as I said, I'll, I'll be over at Obear next Monday at 5.30 for anybody who wants to, to chat in person, kind of a little, little more informal. Um, and we'll try to do the same on Goat Hill in the near future so we can come up with a date. And I really appreciate you spending over two hours on this tonight, and you know we'll we'll um, we'll in, we'll continue inviting you to be in this conversation. Please take advantage and reach out anytime. Okay, thanks all.